it's tradition uh, for me to appear in this, uh, but I've you know, got it in my eyes now. Whole thing stupid. Hello, I'm David. Um, and this is the last time you'll see my face in this seminar, probably. Uh, so look well. Okay. Um, I'm the coordinator of the Maths Learning Centre. Uh, and uh, the reason I put my face there is that people would watch the videos and, and then come in and not know who I was when I talked to them and say, hey, there was this revision seminar. And the guy there said, yeah, that was me. Uh, so that's why I put it on there. Um, and it's uh, semester two, 2019. Uh, and uh, this is a revision seminar for Maths 1A. I've been given some requests. Um, you can ask for more later if we, if we get to a point. And at any point, it is completely OK um, to ask me questions such as, David, should that have been a minus, not a plus? Um, and that's the really important one. Um, and um, you know, what did you mean by that? Or um, could you try that with another example? Um, or hey, this seems connected to other idea. Is it anything? OK, I'm all good. And I may not necessarily cover all possible questions, but I will do my best. All right. So what I've decided to do is start with some notation. <coughs> and what I might do is run through the um, questions I normally ask myself to understand any notation, um, and they can be my headings for this. So, um, right. I mean, the purpose of mass notation is to make it easier to write things down. So that's the whole point, to make things easier. Um, and, um, and usually easier to do calculations. That's one of the other things that mass notation was, uh, is for. Uh, when some mass notation was invented for the very first time, it was so that people could communicate to each other in maths even though they spoke different languages. Uh, and so one of the things about mass notation is it tends to use minimal words. So some notation is a specific notation uh, that we use in this course mainly to set up integrals by first principles, uh, by upper and lower sums. Uh, but it turns out up a lot in Maths 1B uh, and in various uh, engineering and pure maths courses as well later, which is why it's in this course, so that you can get used to it. So the first question I ask about any notation is what does it mean? And also, actually even before that, how do you say it? So, we use this letter, and it normally looks something like this. That's just an example. Uh, so, each part of this you need to say in the right order so that you, you can say it correctly. Uh, this thing is read aloud as the sum of. Um, but we normally put the information about um, I in between the word sum and the word of. So it's the sum from I is one. Actually, you actually usually say equals one to 15 of uh, I squared. Plus two. I mean, that's how you would say it. Uh, so the sum of is this bit here. And from i equals 1 to 15 is these bits here. And the reason we use this letter is it's the um, capital letter sigma. Um, just as a note. which in Greek makes a s sound, which is why it's used s for sum. OK, so that's what it is. How do you say it? Well, it's the sum of something. Um, you can put this bit here at the end of the sentence. It probably makes more grammatical sense in English to have at the end. Um, so the sum of i squared plus 2 from i equals 1 to 15. Um, anything that's grammatical is fine, but most people like to read it in the order it's presented. And so then we need to know, what does it mean?
So, and these are the questions I ask about any maths notation at all. Which is the reason I'm giving you these is so that you can use them for, to make sense of anything else in the future. So what does it mean? Well, this must be, it must mean something, and this is actually short for something. Uh, what it means is that we take this formula and we sub in the numbers i, the, we sub in for i all the numbers from 1 to 15, and it has to be every whole number from 1 to 15, um, and it only works for whole numbers, uh, and then we add them up. So that's what it means. It's short for something that's quite complicated. So just as an example, Now I normally think about it like this. I think if I, I think that I have um, i equals one, i equals two, i equals three, and so on, all the way to i equals fifteen, and each of those I sub into this formula. So I have one squared plus two, plus two squared plus two, plus three squared plus two, plus plus fifteen squared plus two, and that's what it means. It's short for that. Whatever that sum comes to is what this is. So what that means is that this notation is a number. The whole thing, once you've figured it out, is a single number. Uh, and that's useful. It's not, a f it's not a function, not at the moment, it's a number. And these i's aren't really there because they are replaced with the numbers from 1 to 15. So me changing this letter to any other letter will not change what the answer is because they get replaced by other things um, later on. So that's an important thing to know. So just looking at this notation, we've already decided that there's a particular rule. doesn't matter what the letter is. It'll come out to the same answer. And it is a number. Right, that's the next step. So the reason I say what does it mean as well is that you can always go back to this meaning at any time if you need to. There, is, um, there may be what I'm going to cover next, uh, different rules for how it interacts with things um, but you can, and different um, ways that you're allowed to manipulate it. But really, um, you can always do this. It's never a bad thing to do this. And there are several Maple TA questions this semester um, that require you, that the only way to do them is to do this. Okay. So. The next question is, what are the rules? And there's two kinds of rules. There's rules for how you can just manipulate it as it is, and there's rules for how it interacts with other kinds of um, notations. So I'm just going to mix them together here. So the first rule that I already mentioned is that it doesn't matter what the letter is. And that no seems like a stupid thing to write down, but I'm going to write it down anyway. The letter doesn't matter. And what most people call this letter is a dummy variable. It's called a dummy variable. Oh, there's two M's in dummy, ironically. Um, so a dummy variable, it's called a dummy variable because it's not really there. Um, it's just standing in place of something until it gets replaced by something else. It's not like X, which stands for all of the X's that you could possibly have when you have a, a function. Um, it's just standing in place for that. There's another kind of dummy variable you've seen, which is in an integration. Um, if you have an integration, a definite integral, that's a dummy variable as well because it will eventually be replaced by numbers. Okay, it's called a dummy variable and it doesn't matter. So for example, it doesn't matter if you use an I or a J or an N or a W or whatever letter you like. It would be confusing to use a capital sigma in this spot, but you know, because we've already got one. But you could, it would just be confusing. Okay. So the next rule is, um, and it's very hard to describe, 
Uh, the next rule is that you can shift the index over. Um, so some people call it an index as well. Now that's why we use I, I for index. An index um, in this context means the thing that tells you where you are. Um, so, or if you like your index finger, which is your pointy finger, it points at things. That's what an index, index does. So, um, something like this. Uh, the sum from j equals 5 to 28 of j minus 5 all squared. Um, well, the way that shift index shifting works is this. <coughs> the numbers that go in this position, j, are the numbers from 5 to 28. And if I figure out what j minus 5 is, those numbers go from 0 to 23. And so this is really the same as taking numbers from 0 to 23 and squaring them. So it's exactly the same as this. <coughs> just to just clarify how that worked, these are the options for J. 5, 6, 7, 8, 28. And these are the options for J minus 5, 0, uh, 1, 2, 3, 23. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call J minus 5 J. Uh, some people prefer to change the letter when they do this. So they call this one J and this one I or something. Um, uh, but I warn you now that uh, people who use this in, say, engineering maths, um, won't change the letter. So you need to get used to it. <coughs> so this is really just an appeal to what, um, the, uh, what the symbols mean. So in essence, this turns into a list of this, these things squared. Like, this turns into a list of uh, these things minus 5 squared, which is the same as the list of these things squared. So going via the original definition, I can make sense of this. And it's a very useful trick um, now. Um, it, it's like a magic trick. I can um, add 5 here and subtract 5 here, and it works fine. This, this trick only works for addition and subtraction right next to where your letter is. It won't work if you have 2j. You can't just divide these by, multiply by 2 here and divide these by 2 here. And the reason is, well, dividing these by 2 will produce some numbers which are something and a half, and the notation only applies to all the whole numbers between one place and another. So it's just not going to work. Okay, so these are the, uh, the, well, there's one more rule that's based on um, the meaning of what it is, and it's to do with splitting it into pieces. Oh, I've used J now. I'm getting used to J. Uh, the sum from 1 to 20 of J is exactly the same as the sum from J equals 1 to 10 and also the sum from J equals 11 to 20. There's nothing stopping you splitting it into two separate sums and to just say, well, I'll just do the first set of numbers and I'll do the second set of numbers. Or um, there's nothing stopping you getting two sums and joining them together. And there's another example of this, which is actually much more productive. That sort of thing. Well, you could imagine that this would be everything from 1 to 100 minus all the bits we didn't use. This is the same rule. So if you saw something like this and you went, 
damn it, I have a formula for this that starts at 1. That's okay. I can think of everything from 1 to 100 and take off all the numbers I didn't use, which was from 1 to 49. Now, be very careful. This number is not 50 because I need to leave the 50 in, so I don't want to take it off. These are all based on actually imagining it as a list of numbers. So just making sure you've got this, I have 50 squared, 51 squared, up to 100 squared. And if I imagine this num list, the thing I want is this bit. That's here. Oh, yep, sorry, I do want the 50 in, thank you. The thing I want is that bit. And this is all of this. They're both yellow. And this is this bit here. So I can imagine it like that. And I'm the sort of person who will write this sort of thing. Okay. Okay, I mean, there's one other trick. I don't know if it works. It's not, it doesn't really count as a rule, um, but it comes up every so often. Um, but I'm not going to do it here. I'm going to do it as an example of, of using this later. Okay, so these are the three um, sort of things that are tricks based on what the actual notation means. But then there are some other rules that are based on how it interacts with other stuff. Ah, well, I just might need to put in, just, just I'll put a note in it in a second. This is one of the classic ways of doing things uh, where they say A sub I uh, with a subscript. Um, and it's probably worth pointing out what that means at the moment. Um, A sub i means the ith position in the list of numbers which are called a1, a2, a3, etc. So um, you could think of it as f of i, like a function of i, but we don't think of it that way because it's not like there's usually it's not like there's actually a formula for this. It's usually just a list of numbers. They're just more or less random. Um, and it's whichever number you're up to in the list. Um, that's just worth pointing that out. Okay. So if you multiply those numbers by 2 before adding them, so the sum from i equals 1 to 10 of 2ai, well, that's the same as two lots of... And normally we just don't put these brackets in. Because all of this together um, is held together by the sum and the fact that they both use the letter I. <coughs> um, and then we have two of that. And that, that this is, the reason this makes sense is because of the way addition works. If you multiply everything by 2 before adding, it's the same as adding them first and then multiplying by 2. Essentially, we've factorized out a 2 from every term. That's what we've done. And, you know, this is the reason. A1, 2A1 plus 2A2 plus, plus 2A10 is the same as 2A1 plus A2 plus... That's the reason. It's exactly what we're doing. We're factorizing out a 2. It's from the properties of number. But we don't have to think this every time anymore because we have a rule. We can now imagine the two moving outside the sum. But what's really happening is we're factorizing. So if I have the sum from 1 to m, it doesn't even matter what the m is. I'm allowed to put an unknown number, um, unknown number there too. Um, so the point is that, let's just read this. The sum from i equals 1 to m of ai plus bi 
Um, the numbers that i is going to be is all the numbers from 1 to m. The fact that we don't know what m is, well, makes it harder, um, but at least we know it stands in for a number that we don't happen to know right now, and it will be subbed in eventually at some point. Um, we can do those two sums separately. You can imagine it as this thing applying to both of those. You know, sort of like multiplying brackets, but it's not, because it's not really multiplying. Um, but that's sort of what's going on. I guess it's similar to multiplication. When you first learn multiplication, it was adding a whole lot of things. And so it's like that in that sense. It's just that these things aren't all the same thing. When you learn multiplication first, the, the, it was adding several of the same thing. Okay, I think, I think that may be it. Just let me think. There's some formulas. Sorry? So, um, before when you were talking about uh, not using division and multiplication, uh, is that just when changing the indexes? Division and multiplication when changing the index? Yep. Yes. We can't use division and multiplication. This trick where we add 5 here and subtract 5 here, we can only do that with addition and subtraction for changing the index. And what were you wondering about here? Yeah, but this 2 isn't part of the index. It's multiplied on after we've figured out what A is. So that's an important thing to consider. Yes, because there's two different variables here. There's the one that, there's two different unknowns here. We've got all the list of AIs, which are unknown, and we've got the letters, the I itself, and they're doing different jobs, so they behave differently. Okay, I think these are the main rules, these two, that we use. Um, this works perfectly well for division as well, like AI divided by 2. Um, that works. Uh, I don't want to write them down, but I will um, briefly. Uh, the sum notation does not interact particularly well with multiplying the, the terms here. Uh, so what you can't do... You cannot do this. These are not the same. It's wrong. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't even look at it. It does not multi interact with multiplication. Because addition doesn't interact with multiplication that way. If you add a whole lot of things and then multiply a bracket with a whole lot of things, you actually have to multiply everything in one bracket with everything in the other bracket. And that's not what this says. Um, these are just the matching things added up. Uh, so not going to work. So. Just the same as when you learn about square roots and you go, well, how does inter square roots interact with stuff? It doesn't interact with plus underneath it. Same deal with this. This does not interact with times. Okay. So that's pretty much it. Doesn't interact with powers. Um, doesn't interact with pretty much anything other than addition and scalar multiplication. Uh, we're used to that. Vectors do that. Okay. And then the final rules are there are a couple of ones that our, the people who have trod this path before us have figured out what they work out to be. So, they're freebies because the people who've done it, who've come before us, have figured it out already. So, you know, if you add up n lots of 1, that's what this is this is 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Plus one n times, the answer is n. And that goes just as well um, for any number at all. It'll just be n lots of 4 or n lots of whatever. So if I put a number here, a letter here, it'll be n lots of a. Okay. Cool. We add up from 1 to n, uh, the sum from i equals 1 to n of i, which means doing 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus, plus n, um, and always in my head I translate it into what it really means. Um, there is a formula for this, and it's this. Always works out to the correct answer. 
So if I go 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, uh, 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 3 is, is 6, 6 plus 4 is 10, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 10, and that would be the sum from i equals 1, I'm just going to actually do it as an example, 1 to 4 of i, that's this, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, which is 10, and half of 4 times 4 plus 1 is a half times 4 times 5, which is 10, it works, well, it works for, works for n equals 4 anyway. You would normally prove this sort of thing with mathematical induction, but they don't ask you to do this in this, that, in this course. And there's one more freebie formula, um, which I don't know if your lecturer expects you to remember or not. Uh, you might have to check um, with what the lecturer said, and that's the sum from i equals 1 to n of i squared. So 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared, etc. Um, and that's this. Uh, I can only remember one version of this formula. The other one, there's two versions and I can't remember both. I can only remember one. It's n cubed on 3 plus n squared on 2 plus n on 6. There's a factorized version as well. I think it's a sixth of n, n plus 1, 2 n plus 1 but I'd have to expand it out to see if it works out to the same answer. Uh, this one I can remember because I know that it's, they all have one power of n higher than the power that they have as the, on the i. So the single i ends up with an n squared, like an n times n. Uh, no i is ended up, ends up with an n. Two i's ends up with an n cubed. Um, and the n cubed has a 3 on the bottom and the n squared has a 2 on the bottom and the n has 2 times 3 on the bottom. That's how I remember it. I don't know if you're supposed to remember it or not. Yeah. So, yep. Okay. Cool. And just for your interest, because I think it's awesome, you don't need to remember this one. Uh, for when you do I cubed, it's the same answer as what you get when you add up 1 to i, but squared. It's like, <laughs> mind-blowing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. I mean, and every one of them has a formula of some sort. Um, you'll notice that a, in, if you expand this out, you get an n to the power of 4. Um, they always end up with one power higher. Um, it's pretty cool. Okay. So, we need to do some examples that are nice, complicated ones that, that involve the things so that you can see how we use all these rules together. So, uh, I should do one. So uh, this is the last step of understanding a notation, which is to go and find some examples and see if you can use those rules um, properly together. Okay. I mean, the classic example is something that would come up when you do integration uh, by, by first principles. Uh, sorry, I call it by first principles. I think upper and lower sums is what the lecturer would call it. Um, okay. Let's do that one. No, let's make it even harder. <coughs> Stick an eye there. All right. Yep, let's do that. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to use all the rules that we know about what this means um, and how the, it interacts with things to figure it out. So if I have... Three, uh, well, let me just think about what it means. It means that, that um, I will sub into this all the numbers from 1 to n 
And unfortunately, I don't know what n is, so I can't actually figure out an answer. It's going to end up being a formula in terms of n. Um, and I would add them all up. Uh, but I can try and figure out how to do this using the few sums that I have formulas for. So the first thing I notice is that uh, this is made up of uh, something squared with a th times 3 and a 2i. They're added together and then it's divided by 5. Uh, so this is all held together by this divide by 5. Uh, but dividing by 5 is the same as multiplying by a fifth. And I know that if I've got a multiple, I can bring it out. So I can do this. Definitely do that. That's a good start. And now I'm going to analyze what's in here. Uh, well, they're added together, and I know that the rules for addition is that I can add those bits separately, do my sum on each bit separately. Okay. Uh, and now, oh, look, this one, now, now I can look at each sum by itself. In this one, there's a 3, I can pull that out, that's one of the rules. And in this one, there's a 2, I can pull that out, that's one of the rules. Okay, uh, and now this one, I've got a formula for that. I've got a formula for the sum from 1 to n of i. There's a formula for that. That's good. This one, not so much. Um, but if it was just i squared, I'd have a chance. So I could shift that one over. So let's see. Now it really starts at 0. When i equals 1, this is 0. And so, and it finishes at n minus 1. I'm just going to leave that one as it is for the moment, just so it's easier to see what happened here. Cool, cool, cool. All right, doing well. But wait, if this starts at 0, 0 squared is 0. So that doesn't make any difference to the sum. And so I can really start at 1 if I want. I'm just going to be really explicit about this. This is, this is the short version of this, uh, which I probably should have mentioned. So this thing here where I break it into pieces, well, I've got the piece that goes from 1 to n and the piece that just is just 0. That's the other bit that I've done here. So I've got this is just i equals 0, that's that bit there, and i equals 1 to n. So just to be clear, this is the i equals 0 sort of piece. And I'll write that to myself just to make sure I know what's going on. Okay. Well, there's a formula for this, and there's a formula for this, but I'm just going to... Oh, no, don't close those brackets. Right, now I've got it to the stage where I can use the formulas. So, something. So the formula for this is a half of n times n plus 1. And the formula for this is normally n cubed on 3, n squared on 2, n on 6, but I haven't... The top isn't n, it's n minus 1, so that's what I'm going to have to put into the formula. And I didn't give myself enough space. Still not enough space. And if I was in a particularly, um, a particularly anal mood, I would figure this out but I decide not to. I'm just going to leave it there, you know, equals, you know, more algebra. But I, I don't want to do that today. Fortunately, in an exam, you'd probably have to finish it. Uh, though, to be fair, sometimes they're very explicit and they say, write this so that it doesn't have any sum, sum signs, and that is a perfectly good answer with no sum signs. So uh, you can stop there. Yeah.
But I mean, most people would look at this two times a half and go, well, I could at least do that bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let me do one more example when um, we don't actually know what the formula is. Give me a second. So if the sum from 1 to 15 of AI is 7 and the sum from 10 to 15 of AI is minus 8, then what is the sum to, of 1 to 10? No. 9 um, of... 3ai plus 1. Okay, this is a classic that turns up in Maple TAs, which you've finished now, but, you know, hello to students in Maths 1A in the future who are watching this before they do their Maple TAs. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, we don't know what the numbers A1 up to A15 are. We know they're there. We know that at least some of them are negative, because if we add these, these ones, they end up being a negative answer. Um, but they could be anything, right? Uh, they could all be seven, the ones from 1 to 15 could all be 7 fifteenths um, if they're all the same. But we don't know. One of them could be 15,000 and the, other, the next one could be minus 15,000 and, and they'd cancel out. We, we have no idea. But what we do know is what they add up to. Um, and what we want to figure out is what this adds up to. Um, my first step would be to try and turn it into something that just has a single sum next to an AI because then I've got a, a chance. So, I feel like it will be productive to give this thing a name. Let S be that. S for some. So, my rules say that I can do these two sums separately. And I can bring the 3 out. And also, if I add 9 ones together, the answer is 9. OK. Just trying to fix the focus there. OK. So this is cool. Oh, crap, the 3 shouldn't, shouldn't be there anymore. I moved it. Sorry about that. Okay, let's just check that I did everything else right. Okay, so this means that I need to know what the sum from 1 to 9 of AI is. Uh, but that's okay, I know what 1 to 15 is and I know what 10 to 15 is and if I took the 10 to 15 off, that would leave 1 to 9. So, So just in my head, I'm thinking I've got one, two, three. I've got A1 up to A9 and A10 up to A15. And the bit I want is this bit, which is that minus that. That's what I'm thinking. That's what's in my head. Um, okay. And I know what all those answers are. The sum from 1 to 15 was 7. The sum from 10 to 15 was minus 8. And we've got that. And so now I can figure it out. Uh, and 3 times 15 would be 45. And 45 plus 9 would be 54. Oh. 
What's what's going on? Uh, well, I'm doing I'm doing this bit, which is from ten to, from one to fifteen. That's there. Minus this bit, which is that bit there, and that leaves the one to nine. Yeah. I've, it's a bit hard in the diagram because I haven't really showed what I've subtracted from what. Feeling better? Good. That's the sort of question we need to ask. Okay. 54. Cool. Not that it's important that it's 54. Um, right. So, how are people feeling about the sum notation and is there anything else you wanted to know? Sorry? Uh, oh, so do you mean, do you mean something like Good question. All right, I've got two things of this that I could do, so I'm going to do them both, if that's okay. It's just going to take me a while to come up with something that works, so don't commit to writing anything down yet. <laughs> Right, so sometimes you'll see them with just the sum signs written next to each other without brackets, like that, that sort of thing. But what that means is, if I read it aloud, it's the sum from n equals 1 to 20 of the sum from i equals 1 to n of this. So this thing is applying to the entire of that thing, because this is all glued together by the fact that it's a sum. So this is really this. Okay, so we have some choices. Uh, we can either, well, we, you know, no, scratch that. Um, in this particular story, it might be a good idea to try and figure out what the bit inside the brackets is first and then apply this to the answer. Uh, that's a traditional way of running mathematics. So if you put some brackets in, it usually means this bit first. So. I'm going to skip one bit of the working. That's okay. So I brought the three in across the sum. I, could put the, or I brought the sum sign across the addition. I can have the sum of this and the sum of this, but then I've also brought the three out as well. So I've done it all in one go, and that's all right. You're allowed to do that. And we have a formula for this. And we know what this is too. It's n lots of 2. So we've got that. Okay. Um... It seems to me this is going to be easier to figure out if I actually calculate what this is a little bit. So I've got 3 over 2n times n, which would be 3 over 2n squared, and 3 over 2n times 1, which would be 3 over 2n uh, 3 over 2 is 1.5 plus 2 would be 3.5 
which would be 7 over 2. Okay. So now it's two things. It's a formula in terms of the, the index. And so I can now do this. So I did that same trick again. I brought it in across the addition and then I brought the numbers out. Okay. And now... Normally, I would see an I in this spot and this spot. So there's nothing stopping me making it an I now to help myself feel more comfortable with what's going on. Um, or alternatively, you can just imagine that that's what it is. So if this was an I and an I here, I would normally think that there's a formula for this thing and there's a formula for this thing. And so what I get to do is that the number at the top ends up in the spot in that formula I would normally expect there to be an N. So here we go. 20 cubed on 3 plus 20 squared on 2 plus 20 on 6. Half times 20 times 21 because it's 20 plus 1. And that is whatever it is. Do some calculations, we get an answer. It's not going to be pretty. It's going to be in um, some number of twenty-fourths. Oh, no, twelfths. Some number of twelfths. Uh, this bit's a whole number. That's not too bad. But, yeah, we're never going to divide a twenty by six, not productively. There'll always be a third left behind somewhere. So... So it's going to be in thirds at the end, but I'm not going to calculate it. So the other thing we could do something like that. So we have the sum from i equals 1 to 2 of the sum from j equals 1 to i of i plus j. So the problem with this one is that we could try and do the one that's inside the brackets first, but we can't because we don't know what i is. Because we use the i from here to figure out what that is. And so that makes it a bit tricky. But there's only two options for i, so I can use the idea of what the sum means and just write it out, because there's only a couple. It's not going to take long. So I can do this. I'm just going to write it explicitly. So when i equals 1 and when i equals 2 and this one when i equals 1 the i's will be replaced with 1 and this one when i equals 2 the i's will be replaced with 2. So I took the exact formula that was here and I put it in, and I added the two, two options for that that I have with i being 1 and i being 2. And so this 1 here and this 2 here go with this i here. Right. And this is just, from 1 to 1, well, that's just one number. So just this goes with j equals 1. And this one, well, I have j equals 1 and j equals 2. So let's see. When j equals 1, I get 2 plus 1. And when j equals 2, I get 2 plus 2. So just so you know, lots of colour coding today. This one is here. 
and this one is here. Okay, so we have uh, 2 plus 3 plus 4, uh, which is 9. Mm. Did you know only multiples of 3 can be written as the, as the sum of 3 consecutive numbers? It goes for any odd number. Only multiples of 5 can be written as the sum of 5 consecutive numbers. Pretty cool. Which means that the only numbers that can't be written as the sum of consecutive numbers at all um, are the powers of 2. Which is one of my favourite facts about the powers of 2. I call it the sausage stacking theorem. Ask me one day about why. Um, okay. I think we've covered everything that we might want to say um, about sum notation. Uh, just a couple of pointers. This will come back, so it's a useful thing to know how to do. Um, if you continue, plan to continue doing courses with maths in the title, it will come back. Um, and in Maths 1B in particular, uh, we do it, but we add up infinitely many things instead of just some. Uh, so, um, just so you know. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, that was comprehensive, I think. All right. Cool. Let's do some implicit differentiation. So when people said implicit differentiation, was there anything in particular they were thinking of? Because, you know, these notes aren't the best. We have one page on it in these notes. It's probably why you've asked me to cover it. <laughs> so these are the current version 2019 semester 2 version of the Maths 1A uh, book of notes. Um, and their motivating example is to find out how steep is the tangent at a particular point on a circle. Okay. I feel like it might be productive for me to just do an example and talk about what's going on here. But I will just talk about the philosophy. Um, there's actually a theorem called the implicit function theorem um, that allows you to use implicit differentiation in these situations. And it goes something like any curve, um, well, you know, philosophically, any curve has some sort of formula, some sort of equation that describes the curve. And so it'll be something like, you know, wicked thing involving x and y equals number there will be some sort of equation that does it. And you'll normally do it as like f of x and y equals c, something like that. And this um, equation will describe the curve. Uh, this is called a Cartesian equation for the curve. Okay, so circles have one that's like x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Um, classic circle. Ellipses have a similar thing. Um, hyperbolas have them. Um, there's some funky ones called elliptic curves. Uh, and, or any, and any equation that you happen to write down that involves both x and y, and it's equal to a number, um, traditionally zero, but it's equal to a number, will give you some sort of curve. Like if you go to Desmos and you just type random crap, you'll get a curve. And ta-da, right? You know, it's not that fabulous. Um, but if, you know, you could type... And you'll get an ellipse. Um, all right, cool, and you know, oops. 
Yay. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. So, cool. And that's one of the big ideas in mathematics is that if you, if you, you know, go through all of the points and check which ones satisfy the equation, like which ones when you put it into that come out to five and which ones don't, and you color in green all the ones that come out to five, you'll get a curve. Right. And that's essentially what Desmos is actually doing. It's literally just doing that, but very fast. Um, though I'm sure if you, you, if you tweet at one of the Desmos people, they'll give you some better details on the actual thing that's going on. But, um, they'll, but that's the general idea. Okay. So that's great. But we really, um, we live in a land where we prefer functions. Like, and none of these curves are functions. Like, not in the traditional sense. Um, there, it's not like there is a function that where you go, y equals function of x, and it gives you and, you, and for every x, you draw a height or a depth based on what y comes out to, and that draws the curve. It just doesn't work, because all of these have this issue. Um, all of these have this issue that a vertical line hits them more than once. Like the green one is horrifyingly wrong. Like it hits it infinitely many times or none. The red one, there's some places where it's probably okay, but other places not so much. And the ellipse, pretty much every point there hits it twice. Um, so none of these are the graphs of traditional functions. But if we're very clever and we zoom in on just a little tiny bit of it, well, that bit looks like a function. And so it would be reasonable to think that nearby to the point you're, you're thinking about, there could conceivably be a function that matches your graph at that spot. Right. That's the idea. So, it's not the graph of a function, okay? But nearby to P, there is a function like y equals g of x. That matches nearby. So the idea is that if you're extremely close to p, there is a function that's okay nearby. It doesn't matter what it does outside, it just has to be correct at this spot. And that function, that function has a derivative. And that derivative, we're going to say, well, it matches the curve at that spot. Um, and so we're going to say that's the derivative that we're looking for. That's the philosophy that's going on here. But we're not going to do any of that, actually. We're not going to figure out the function that matches at this spot. We're just going to assume it's there. Okay? So the idea is, so... Nearby to any point, we can imagine that y is a function of x. And do our derivatives as if it was. Now that was, took me a little while to say, but I just wanted to talk about what the idea was. Because I, I found implicit differentiation a little bit too much magic when I learnt it. Um, and I rather like thinking, oh, it's okay, I can do this, because nearby to where I am, it's, uh, it's okay. And I don't really even need to know what that function is, and just to believe that it's there. So now I'll do an example. Let's do one of the ones um, on my curve here. 
uh, x cubed plus yx minus x squared plus e to the y equals 8. Okay. Oh, just a second. Can we not make it 8? Just give me a moment. Uh, I'll tell you what number it is in a, at a, at, in a second. No, there's... Sorry, my... Someone has drawn on my computer screen. And it looks on my screen like there's a comma just here. <laughs> okay, right. That's why I kept rubbing things. Okay, at the point... Um, Do the point three zero. Uh, let me just do a calculation. Nineteen. Okay, cool. Um, I just needed to change the number so that I could make sure my point was actually on the curve. Um, so if I just picked a number and subbed it in here and then made it equal to whatever number that came out to so that I knew it was on the curve. There's the, there's the psychology of how the, how the lecturers write this stuff. Okay, so um, not that we can use Desmos in the exam, uh, but uh, just so you know, this is the curve x cubed plus y x minus x squared minus e to the y equals 19. And this is the point 3, 0 just there. And uh, the tangent's going to be down here. So its slope is going to be pretty steep and negative. So we've got an idea of what it should be. Can't do that sort of reasoning in the exam, unfortunately, but at least we've got an idea of what we're expecting. Uh, so we'll do implicit differentiation. So we know that whatever y is, it's really a function of x. At least close to this point it is. And we only need it to be a, a, a function of x close to this point because derivatives are all about what happens when you're close to a point, so it'll be okay. So we're going to differentiate both parts of this equation with respect to x. Now remember that d on dx, when you pronounce it aloud, means the derivative of, so it can't stand on its own. So the derivative of this thing must be the derivative of this thing. This one we can do. The derivative of a constant is zero. It doesn't change when x changes. And that makes sense. If you're on this curve, then no matter which point you're at, the answer is 19. So if you move the x over a bit and stay on the curve, the answer will still be 19 and it didn't change. So there's no change there. Okay, this one doesn't have an, a y in it, so we'll be fine. So it'll just be 3x squared. Be great. I'm going to need more space than this. Damn it. I'll move my zero in a second. Um, OK. So when we imagine this, we're going to say, just a second, this y is secretly a function of x. So there is some sort of wicked formula that will allow me to calculate x from y, which is hidden inside that letter y. That's how I think about it. So that's really two functions of x multiplied by each other. So I'm going to have to use the product rule. So um, I need the derivative of y and keep the x plus keep the y and differentiate the x. That was the product rule just then. 
So just so that we keep track of this, this became this by, by the product rule. Okay, the x squared is going to be okay. 2x. And the e to the power of y, okay. Well, the y is a function of x and it's inside another function, so I'm going to have to use the chain rule. So, uh, the derivative of e to the power of anything is e to the power of the thing, so that's fine. And then because of the chain rule, I have to multiply by the derivative of that, which is this. Okay. Cool. So what we have here is that 3x squared plus whatever the derivative of y is, um, times x plus y times 1 minus 2x plus whatever the derivative of y is times e to the y is 0. I can rearrange this to get a formula for dy on dx. So what I'll do is I'll move everything that doesn't have a dy on dx in it over to this side. Um, I'd like to move it away from here and I'll keep the dy and dx things here. Okay, so let's just check I've got everything right. The 3x squared is there, the dy on dx x is there, the y is now over there but it's a minus y. 2x is now over here, but it's a 2x, and this is still here. Okay, everything's still here. I haven't lost anything along the way. And then what I'll do is I'll factorize out this dy on dx, so there's only one of them on the page. And now if I divide that, I have a formula for what dy and dx works out to be. This is a really interesting formula because it's based on both the x and the y. So um, it's not the traditional way we'd write this, but the point is that there is, you know, philosophically some secret function of x that would go in this spot that would calculate this just on, based on the x if we wanted. And we know that whatever that function is, the y will work out to be zero at this point. So that'll be all, all be okay. So I can just sub it in now. So at um, 3, 0. I mean, to technically, it should be, you should write this little duva thingy here, but you're allowed to skip that bit if you don't want it. Um, but this says dy and dx evaluated at the point where xy is 3, 0. So, so this little duva thing here is saying evaluate that at this point. But you are allowed to skip that and just write this, you know, skip that. Okay. So this will be minus 3 times 3 squared. Oh no, I need more space. <laughs> minus 3 times 3 squared minus 0 plus 2 times 3 over 3 plus e to the 0. You may notice I chose 0 so that e to the 0 was a number that I was familiar with. It wasn't like e cubed or something, it's just 1. So, uh, Okay, so that's minus 27 plus 6 over 3 plus 1. So minus 21 over 4, whatever it is. So that's what, 5 and a quarter. Oh yeah, looks about right on my picture. Now, just a second, what did I ask myself? Uh, find the equation of the tangent. Okay, well I found the slope of the tangent because the derivative is the same as the slope of the tangent. Um, if I want the equation of the tangent, I'm going to need to find a line of this slope that goes through the point 3, 0. So the tangent It has slope minus 1 over 1 over 4 and passes through the point 3, 0. So there's multiple ways that I could go about attempting to find that equation. Most people would write it as y equals minus 21 over 4x plus c and figure out what the c is. 
Uh, some people have a fancy ver formula that just gives them directly the answer. Um, but I'm going to do that one. So the equation, the equation is y equals minus 21 over 4x plus c for some c. Uh, we know that if I sub in 3, 0, it'll work. And so C is, well, plus that, uh, which is uh, 63 over 4. Ah, oh, and it fell onto the next page. How disappointing. So therefore, the equation of the tangent is Y equals minus 21 over 4X plus 63 over 4. Let's see if my machine agrees with me. I will show the screen in a minute. Oh, it's beautiful. Ready? Ready? Ooh. So that's the equa that there is the equation of my line. And look, there it is. Perfectly good tangent. Ah. Perfectly good tangent at this point. Sweet. <laughs> and if I zoom really far in, you won't be able to tell that tangent from the curve, which is the point of a tangent. That's what tangents are. They approximate your curve nearby to where the point is. Right. Cool. And you could technically do that process at any point. Now that we know um, what uh, dy and dx is as a formula in terms of x and y, we can figure out the slope at any point. Um, except at the points where the curve is perfectly vertical that will be an issue. Um, so, um, well just a second, just to follow up. You know, follow up question. Are there any points where the tangent's vertical? And the answer is, well, a vertical line has undefined slope. And so if the tangent were vertical, then this slope would need to be undefined, which means the denominator would need to be zero. So, so So we would need x plus e to the y to be 0 um, since it's the denominator. OK. So I guess any point on my curve that where x is minus e to the y will be a point that has vertical tangent. Or even better. Right. Well, so we would try and solve that. It's going to be hard. I don't know if I want to go here. I might, I might give up in a second. Um, I don't think the lecturer would give you something this distressingly hard. So we could sub that back into the equation and get x cubed plus ln of minus x and we would solve that and they would be the x's at which there were vertical tangents. Wow. Fabulous. <laughs> yep. What's that here? So the equation of a line is always y is almost always y equals slope times x plus constant. And we have to and we know 
that the point three zero is on this line, and so that means we know that the point three zero will satisfy this equation. No matter what, whatever the C is, it has to satisfy it. So I, I give up, you know. Uh, they would normally give you one that was a little easier than that. Or they might give you one where the denominator was like x plus 1, and then you would know that x would have to be minus 1. Um, yeah. Okay. All righty All right. How are we feeling about the implicit differentiation? Who actually asked for that? How are you feeling? Good. <laughs> Anything else on this topic you wanted to ask? I'm not entirely sure what scope of things your lecturer could ask about, but the only thing in the notes was finding slopes of tangent. So, yeah. One thing I find interesting whenever I teach this to students in, in a different course, the thing that bothers them the most is the bit where they find the equation of the straight line. Um, and it's always the things that you learned in the past that you forget, and then they throw you off. <laughs> yeah. So, cool. Okay. Oh, we're doing so well. I'm feeling good. I, I think I've done a good job of those ones. So I'll put them at the top when I put them back on the, on the Maths Learning Center website. I try and put the things you, that are most, that are the best at the top of the list. I don't have this obsessive need to keep them all. I'm a bit of a, a revision seminar hoarder. Um, but uh, I... I like to put the things I think ones think are the best at the top, just for your own references when you watch them all. Okay. What did you want to know about matrix inverses? Was that you? Yeah. yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. <coughs> we don't have matrices in high school in South Australia anymore, do we? Okay. Year 11? Oh, that's, that's like forever ago. <laughs> okay. Good to know. We've never had it in New South Wales, uh, which is where I'm from. Though I don't know. Never was meaning like in the intervening some number of years since I was in high school. Um, it could have happened at some point, uh, but it's not there anymore either. So anyway, when I came to uni, um, yeah, I had to learn it all from scratch, and all my friends had seen some of it, uh, which wasn't fun, which was so. Uh, to be fair, I'd done most of integration from Maths 1A when I, in high school, and so I didn't have to concentrate so hard on that. Um, yeah. OK, so matrix inverses. All right, so um, matrices are, these, are this new thing I mean, newish, but they're, they're, they're new, new to maths, like in the last 100, 150 years or so. So that's actually quite new. Calculus is like 400 years old. Um, so matrices are quite a new thing to maths, relatively speaking. Um, and before there were matrices, there were linear equations. Um, and back in the day, like in the 1850s, um, when Lewis Carroll uh, was writing Alice in Wonderland, they are a big thing, linear equations, and Lewis Carroll's research area as a mathematician was determinants um, for linear equations, because matrices didn't exist yet. Um, and later on, people thought of matrices, and they went, oh, this is pretty cool, and that makes some of our other stuff a little easier. So there's a tiny bit of history for you. Um, my favorite Lewis Carroll uh, story is that uh, he wrote Alice in Wonderland, and Queen Victoria said, this is pretty cool. Send me your next book. And so he sent her his textbook on determinants. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so matrices sort of began life as, as holding the coefficients of linear equations. Um, but then they sort of took on a life of their own as objects that are like numbers that do things that numbers do. So they do multiplication and they do addition and they do subtraction. They don't do division, which is sad. Um, and so we have inverses instead. So that's the big idea. And I'm just going to start with something, and matrix multiplication is the key to all of this. 
So matrix multiplication came about from the way that we turn linear equations into matrices. So when we see a linear equation, a system of linear equations, and we turn that into a matrix, I'm just going to put a plus Z here too. No, I won't. And we turn that into a matrix and it becomes this. Right? They're the coefficients that live here. And there's also another column, which is the, co the answers, like that. And it becomes this. Okay, so you're used to, most of the time we don't see this bit in the middle here, right? We, we just have this glued to that. Uh, that's normally how we do it, an augmented matrix they call it. That's what we see most of the time. But in the background, it's actually this. That there is a matrix, it's multiplied by this column matrix, and the answer is this column matrix. And the idea is that this thing multiplied by this is this. Because that's what matches up. Okay, so the first row here, this times this is that, which is 8. So that's how um, the matrix multiplication works. And the second row times this column is this thing here. And that is the basis of matrix multiplication. Matrix multiplication goes like that. So if you have a row, I will not put one there so it's obvious what's going on, times a column, then what you will get is the matching entries of each multiplied and added together. So you'll get 4 times 2 plus 3 times 9 plus 7 times 6. And just to be absolutely clear what's going on, the first two multiply and the second two multiply and the third pair multiply. And you get whatever answer you get. It's just a single number. Uh, 8 plus 27 uh, would be 35, plus 42 would be 77. Cool. How very biblical. Um, okay. That's the idea. And if you want to multiply matrices that have more than one row and more than one column, You'll do it one row and column at a time. Oh, and I didn't bring a plastic sleeve. That would have been cool. Neither did I bring a whiteboard marker, so really it's pointless. Just give me a second. Okay, so this actually begins the rules for how matrices multiply. In order for this process to work, you need the number of entries this way in the first matrix to be the same as the number of entries this way in the second matrix. Um, and I actually think about that completely visually. Um, so, yeah, or it's not going to work. And I have a plan. I do have a plan. It's going to require me to do... Give me a moment. I would not re recommend doing this every time you had to do it in an exam. I'd practice getting good at it without doing what I'm about to do. Oh, broke it.
Yes, that'll work. If you've ever been to the Mass Learning Centre and asked me to explain something, you may have a similar experience to this. Though I'm much more likely to do something like jump up and do something on the floor graph. There we go. Just need some nice highlighting. So, cool. First row, first column. We have 2 times minus 1, which is minus 2. It's plus 6, which is up to 4, plus 2, which is 6. And then keep that first row and we'll just go along all the columns. 2 times 1 is 1, plus 1 times 1, which is now 3, plus 1 times 0 is still 3. And you'll see I do it as a running total when I do it in my head. So 2 times 3 is 6. Uh, plus 5 is 11, minus 8 is 3. And now I'll do my second row. 8 times minus 1 is minus 8, uh, plus 0 times 6, so it's still minus 8, plus 7 times 2, which is 14, which is uh, 6. Mm, okay. Uh, and 8 times 1, plus 0 times 1 is still 8, plus 7 times 0 is still 8. And 8 times 3 is 24, plus 0 times 5 is still 24, minus 7 times 8. 24 minus 56. Fun. Well, 56 minus 24 would be 32, so it's negative 32. Okay. And I've run out of everything. Whoa. I've run out of all the bits, and so there I am. So just for future reference, if you're reading this, you know, this row times this column ended up here. And as a separate example, like this row and this column ended up here. Okay. So some things you might notice about the matrix multiplication is that it doesn't really matter what order I do it in. As long as I make sure everything lines up where it's supposed to go, it doesn't matter. So I can multiply this, this whole matrix by that column first and get this answer here and then multiply this whole matrix by that column and get this answer here, and then multiply this whole matrix by that column and get this answer here. Alternatively, I could do this row times this whole matrix to get that row, which is what I did first, what I did, and this row times this whole matrix to get that row. Or I could do pieces by pieces, and as long as it all works, it'll be fine. But it's important to know that all of those options are possible. Um, and one of the things that we get really that's really important in Maths 1A and B um, is thinking about it as the whole left-hand matrix times one column at a time. That's a useful way of thinking about it. So we can also think about it as A times column 1, column 2, column 3 is the same matrix as whatever you get from A times column 1 times whatever you get from A times co plus, not plus, next to whatever you get from A times column 2, next to whatever you get from A times column 3. That's a useful way of thinking about it. But it works perfectly well with rows on the other side. Um, so, uh, row 1, row 2, row 3. Well, I'll do it with row 2 so it matches my example. Times B is whatever this row is on top of whatever this row is. So you are allowed to do it row-wise or column-wise, and it works out the same, and all of these things work out the same. And it's a little bit like when you do fraction um, multiplication. You can multiply the tops and the bottoms separately, but you can also like cancel things from one side to the other because of all of the ways that you're allowed to arrange it and still have the same answer. Right, okay. And all of this works because it doesn't really matter what order you do it in. It just, as long as you put things in the right spot, it works. Okay, uh, there is one uh, final thing that is a useful way of thinking of matrix multiplication while I'm at it, and I just think it's important to do. Um, there's, you know, these are ways to think about it. Uh, there's one final thing which is also a way of thinking about it, 
which is that if you multiply a matrix by a single column, try and figuring out what that does. Um, just give me a second. So let's just see what happened when I multiply this matrix by that column. So I end up with minus 2 times minus 1, 1 times 6, 1 times 2. Right, and this 8 times minus 1, 0 times 6, 7 times 2. So both of these ended up being multiplied by that minus 1. And both of these ended up being multiplied by this 6. And both of these ended up being multiplied by that 2 because of the positions they are in. And we added them together. So it turns out... I'll just do this one as an example just so you can see what happened. Both the 2 and the 8 were multiplied by a minus 1. And both the 1 and the 0 were multiplied by a 6. And both the 1 and the 7 were multiplied by a 2. And we added the results together. So what happened was, um, multiplying a matrix by a column came out to the same answer as taking these three columns as vectors and multiplying them by the entries of this and adding them up. So matrix, so column 1, column 2, column 3 times entry 1, entry 2, entry 3 was this many column 1s and this many column 2s and this many column 3s. Which I think is really, really cool. Okay, multiplying a matrix by a column is the same thing as doing a linear combination of the columns. And that is why linear combinations and spanning has so much to do with matrices. Because it's already there in your matrix multiplication. Right. So just, I may or may not get to spanning, but I just wanted to point that out. These are three ways to think about matrix multiplication um, that are useful for the perspective of A, figuring out what you're doing, but also B, proving stuff. And mathematicians are nothing if not interested in proving stuff. Okay. Cool. Right. So now that's great. So we've seen how the matrix multiplication sort of lives in this world between the matrices and the vectors and the entries and all of these things can be put together in all these different ways. And that's why matrix multiplication is such a useful thing because they all go together in these different ways, which means I can use them for all these different stuff. Cool. So now, once linear equations um, were related to matrices and matrices were invented in order to, to do this, um, and once matrix multiplication was created and we noticed how cool it was, um, matrices started to become objects in their own right. We started to say, well, this, this thing that is a bit like a number, it's just a number made of a box of all these numbers, we can do number things to it. We can add them, uh, we, can, we can multiply them. Um, it seems reasonable to attempt to divide them, which didn't work. That's okay, because division doesn't really exist. In the real numbers, there is not really such a thing as dividing by two. There is really multiplying by a half. So I can pitch all division in terms of multiplication anyway. And so that's how I'm going to solve the problem of matrix division. I'm going to pitch it as a multiplication instead. So that's the idea. So matrix inverses, the idea is that with numbers, if I have 2 times a number a half, I get 1. And 1 has the property that if I multiply it by anything, nothing happens. So with matrices, if I have a matrix A times a matrix called A to the minus 1, I get the identity matrix. So they match up like that. Um, 1 for the numbers is the thing that when you multiply by it doesn't change the answer. I for matrices is the thing that when you multiply by it, it doesn't change the answer. Um, and so the inverse is whatever you multiply by your original thing by to get the thing that doesn't change when you multiply it by stuff. 
Now, that sentence is crap, um, but that's the idea. Okay, so these things, you know, they're called the identity for multiplication because they don't change anything, they just produce the thing you had before. So they reveal the identity of the thing you have. If, you, if I told you, say, I've got a number, its name is Fred, you get to ask me one mathematical operation so that you can figure out what Fred is. And you'll say, Fred times one, please. And I'll say three, and you'll go, so Fred is three then. That's the idea, okay? So that's the idea. Um, I've got a secret matrix, and I get, you get one matrix operation, and, and you, uh, you want to figure out what it is? Well, multiply it by I. That'll do it. Okay. Cool. And so the trick is, which matrices have them, and how do you figure it out? All right. Big questions. Which matrices have inverses? And how do you find them? Okay. All right. Which matrices have inverses? Well, there's two parts to this question. There's two parts to this question. The first answer is only square matrices can have inverses. Nothing else has one. Well, except, of course, <coughs> technically, most matrices of, you know, there are quite a few matrices that if you put, that aren't square, that if you put something here will produce an identity. Uh, but if it's a proper identity, it has to work on, a proper inverse, it has to work on both sides. Um, so we also need crap. Damn it. So the definition, mixing my capitals and my smalls, inverse of A has A times A inverse equals I and A inverse times A equals I. You need both of them to work in order for it to be a proper inverse. So some non-square matrices have um, an inverse in inverted commas that works on one side. So if you've got a matrix that isn't square, you can often find a matrix that goes on one side or the other to produce an identity, but it would be impossible to have one that works on both sides because A, they'd have to be different sizes anyway, and B, um, even if you could find one that goes on one side and one that goes on the other, only one of them will be able to produce an identity. You can't make it work both ways. So there you go. So which matrices have inverses? Well, the first answer is only square matrices can. And then you go, well, okay, only square matrices can, but which square matrices have inverses? And then there's a list of things that tell you whether a matrix has an inverse. I'm pretty sure this course has like a list of different things that tell you whether it has an inverse or not. Um, and I don't know what the list is off the top of my head, but I've got a few of them. So one of the things on the list uh, is that, you know, uh, the square matrices do these things. And the things that do this, that, and the matrices that do these things, have inverses. So uh, one of them is that the determinant of it is not zero. So you, only, you did determinants right at the end, didn't you? Yeah. So that's the last piece of information. And the really interesting thing is you did it last, but determinants were, the f were invented even before matrices existed. Uh, they belong to linear equations. Um, and so uh, but they've just fallen out of fashion since 1850. Um, so, um, so determinants, uh, the determinant's not zero. Um, you could have, 
um, that the columns um, are linearly independent. And you could have that the rows span Rn, where n is the size of the matrix. And it works per perfectly well the other way. The, the rows could be linear independent and the columns could span Rn. Um, and you could have AX equals zero has the only solution of X equals zero. I think that's pretty much the whole list. Thank you. All oh, right, yes, you know. All right, the reduced ratio loan form is I. Oh, yeah, yeah, love it. Yeah. You can write A as a product and I should be just be comprehensive just so that I can, you know, match the whole list. There is one more which says that um, AX equals B has a solution for every B. Technically, it has to be a unique solution, but just having a solution at all is fine. So all of these things, if you find out any one of those things about your matrix, then it has to be invertible. It has to have an inverse. None of these tell you how to find the inverse, by the way. Like, not one of these tells you how to do it. Um, but they do tell you when it happens. A few of these can be modified just a little to tell you how to find the inverse. Um, there's, there's, you know, the, the being a product of elementary matrices is, is a good one. If you can find the inverse of all those elementary matrices, then you should be able to do it. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, if you do know what all the solutions are for all of these, you can do it. Uh, because you just, the first column of your inverse has to, when you multiply by A, should be the first column of the identity. So if you put the identity first column here and find out what the B is, that should do the trick as well. Um, yeah. And most of these are actually related. So if you do A times X, that's the matrix A times a column, which is the same as a combination of the columns of A. So this thing here is the same as doing a combination of the columns of A, and that's exactly what you're doing when you're spanning. So if you span the columns of A, that's what AX is. And spanning the columns of A and producing everything that you can produce is the same as saying I span the columns of A and I can produce anything that I want. This and this are the same thing. I think that's cool. Um, and actually, this one... AX equals zero having only the solution X equals zero is the same as saying that the columns are linearly independent. They're the same thing. Um, they're literally the same definition um, if you look carefully at, at what A times X means in terms, of, in terms of linear combinations. And these two are the same thing as well, showing that the reduced rational form being the identity is the same as being a product of elementary matrices. Because an elementary matrix... Um, is the same as a row operation. That's what it's for. Um, so doing row operations in the identity is the same as multiplying by elementary matrices and getting the identity. So these are all related to each other. And one of the reasons that this theorem, when I did maths one, I had a very cool lecturer in first year maths who would stop halfway through the lecture and tell a joke or a story every time. Um, but he would also do things like, he had this theorem at the beginning uh, went the f at the beginning of um, Mass 1A algebra and he, and he would add to it. And so every, every time we found something else that was related, he would bring it out and write on it again and add a little bit extra every, every time. And so by the end of it, we really knew how all these things were related. And I thought that was one of the coolest things, um, one of the best things any of my maths lecturers has done 
is to try and relate it as we go to everything. Um, because then I felt like it, I knew what was going on because everything was connected. Okay, so um, that brings us to how do we find an inverse? And the answer is um, yeah, via these two. These two are the quickest way to find an inverse. Yep? Yep, I did that. No, because the phrase linearly independent only applies to column, only applies to vectors, not to matrices. So grammatically, we just can't say it. So yeah, um, and also for a not square matrix, the columns being independent isn't the same as the rows being independent. Um, and so, because um, only for square matrices does the rows being independent mean the columns are independent. Um, so we don't sort of have a terminology because it only happens sometimes. Does that answer the question? Cool. But it's a good question. I mean, it, it, would be, it would be reasonable to have a terminology that said the matrix is linearly independent. But we've sort of got a, a word for that. It's called invertible. So, yeah. That would be reasonable. We just don't do it. Sometimes language is like that. It's just like, there is no word for this. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So how do you find an inverse? Uh, well done for interrupting me to ask that before I moved on. That was important. Okay. The quickest way is to use that thing with the row operations and the, uh, and the, in the, the elementary matrices. And we're not really going to be using it. It won't look like we are, but we are. So you make your matrix and you line it up next to the identity and you do row operations as if it was one big matrix. And if you get to the identity here, then whatever this becomes is the inverse. And I can even prove that this works. Uh, it's not quite a proof. You know, it's sort of a semi-proof, so I'll put it in inverted commas. I can make it into a proof by just making it more rigorous and writing all my sentences as full sentences and stuff. But the proof goes like this. A to I via row ops is the same as A times various elementary matrices being the identity, where these are elementary matrices. And the reason that is is that the point of ele elementary matrix is that when you multiply it on the left-hand side, it does the same job as doing the row operation. That's the whole idea of an elementary matrix. Okay? And so getting from here to here by row ops is the same as multiplying all these elementary matrices to be the identity. And look, matrix times A is the identity. This thing has to be the inverse. Yep, I'm just going to repeat that so that it appears on the recording. So yes, this E1 is the first row operation you did. And this E2, which is on the left-hand side, um, is the second operation you did. And then the next operation's here and the next operation's here. You need to put them on the left because that's how elementary matrices work. And the reason they go on the left is because of this. If we put them on the right, they'd be doing combinations of the columns. So when we put them on the left, they do combinations of the rows, which is what a row operation is. So they have to go on the left because they modify the rows. If we did column operations, they'd go on the right. But we don't because we're not used to that. So, Okay, but look, I'm going to rewrite this.
I have a matrix times A as the identity. This must be the inverse. Because when I multiply it by A, I get the identity. <laughs> awesome! Okay. Now, watch this trick. Right. Wow. So A inverse is EK, E2, E1, time. That's what A inverse is. That's what we've just figured out. Which is EK, E2, E1, times the identity, because something by the identity doesn't do anything. And doing all this times the identity is the same as doing row operations. Because that's what elementary matrices do. That's my I, I love this proof. I love it so much. The only reason we, we need row per elementary matrices, really, is to do this proof. Which makes me so sad that the lecturer probably didn't do this proof. He did? Awesome! <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to have elementary matrices unless you have this proof. So I'm so glad it's in there. That's my f you are. The only proof about matrices that is better than this is the proof of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, which isn't until mass 1b, and they won't give you the proof. But it's a cool, cool proof. Like, yes. Okay. Anyway. Okay. So, that's the proof. We don't need the proof, but it's nice to have the proof. Uh, and we should do one. And I know I've gone over time, and that means I'm going to not have much time to eat my lunch, but I don't care. I want to finish this. Okay. I will have some water, though. All right. Whew. Okay. I'm going to just go all out and do a three by three. I'm pretty sure they won't ask you to do a three by three in your exam, though. Uh, it's just too big. Maybe if there were more zeros in it. Let's let. I'm just going to change this entry just here. Just give me a second. Yep, let's do that. Okay. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> In your exam. I don't like your question. I'm going to do this question instead. <laughs> <coughs> I know um, a, a lecturer who once, in her differential equations exam, said, Write down some differential equations you think you can solve and solve them <laughs> as her exam question. <laughs> Points will be awarded for difficulty. Um, yeah, it's a little bit like judging a, a diving competition. Okay, so the rules are um, that if we line it up next to an identity matrix, and we do the row operations, until this becomes the identity, uh, then that will find the inverse. And if this doesn't become the identity, it doesn't have an inverse. Right. I really hope I've chosen one that does have... Uh, um, that would be sad. Um, let's hope. Okay. So um, I do row operations one column at a time. And I turn each column into the, the, each, the matching column of the identity. Um, and I just keep track of where, where I'm up to. So I'm going to focus on this column first. And I'm going to turn that column into the first column of the identity. It's already got a 1 and a 0 where I'd like it to be. So I need to put a 0 here. And so I can do the new row 3 is the old row 3 minus 3 of row 1. And that will do the trick. So I didn't change row 1. And I didn't change row 2, but I did change row 3. So this minus 3 of that is 0, because that was the point. This minus 3 of that, 6 minus 3 times 2, is also 0. That's why I changed it to a 6. Um, and this minus 3 of that is uh, uh, 7 minus 18, 
which is negative 11. Sad, but there it is. And this minus 3 of that is negative 3, and this minus 3 of that is still 0, and this minus 3 times 0 is still 1. So I literally treat it as one big matrix. Okay, so I've got my first column of the identity done. Beautiful. So now I would focus on making the second column of the identity. So my second column of the identity will have a 0, a 1, and a 0. Um, traditionally, you make the 1 first, and then you make the 0, but it doesn't really matter. If you happen to find a quicker way to make a 0 now, then do it, and I can do that, because if I do the subtraction, I can make a 0 here. So I'll do that first, if that's okay. So I didn't change row 2, I didn't change row 3, I'm going to move that 1 over, and I did this minus that, which is still 0, this minus that, 0, this minus that, which is negative 2, this minus that, which is still 1, 0 minus 1, which is negative 1, and 0 minus 0, which is 0. Yep, okay. Okay, so I'm nearly done. Um, I need a 1 in this position, so I'll divide that 1 by 2. Did I do something wrong? No, you're okay? Okay. Cool, so now um, I'll divide this one by 2. Technically there is no division, I'll multiply it by half. So I didn't change row 1, I didn't change row 3, and I divided this one by 2. Okay. Uh, one thing that people forget to do uh, when they do this dividing by 2 is they often forget to do it on the identity matrix side. So just that's one of the things that I've noticed people do before, so it's something to keep a watch for. Okay. And now... This one's going to be fun because we're, we're going to have some fractions with 11ths, but let's go. We'll be fine. Uh, so uh, now I've got my second column of the identity is good, and so now I need my third column of the identity. I can't... I, I, I could technically make a zero here by, you know, adding two of this to that, but that would destroy the zero I made over here. So I can't do that. So the only choice I have is to use the bottom row to affect these ones because it's got zeros here, and so it won't affect the ones I already made. And that's a, that's a mistake that some people make when they first learn how to do row operations, is they do whichever row operation they first think of that does the thing here, and don't keep track of the fact that it breaks all the stuff you just carefully set up. So that's why, um, as you move forward through this, you tend to only be able to use rows below where you are up to, to affect the rows above. Okay, so first I'll do this. Uh, my row 3 is minus an 11th of row 3. That'll stick a 1 where I want it. Okay. Um, that's a 3. So... Uh, I should say some people like to put their row operation next to the answer, and that's okay. And some people like to write it between the matrix and the next matrix, which is probably the one that makes the most sense, actually. Um, and I should also say you should not put equals as here, uh, because uh, none of these matrices are actually equal to each other. So this is an algorithm, not an equation. So, yeah. No one will probably care too much. It'll just annoy the person marking it. You don't want a grumpy marker because they're less generous. <laughs> um, okay. So now I want a zero here. So row two can be row two minus four of row three. And I want a zero here. So row one can be row one plus two of row three. This is the only situation where you can do two row operations at once. Uh, the situation where you're using one row to affect both the other rows. Um, so you shouldn't do something like dividing by 2 and then... Um, you shouldn't do something like dividing by, by 2 and then adding it to the other row at the same time because people will have trouble keeping track of, it, of all of the numbers and how they changed. 
Um, technically, it is okay to do these two at the same time. Like if the rows don't affect, if they're just separate rows and you divide them by stuff, that's okay. But anyway, I just tend to write them down as I think of them. So, okay. So I didn't change row three. And I can tell already, um, I could tell actually back here that it was going to have an inverse, even before I finished. So if someone asked, is this going to have, it, does this have an inverse, I could have, and didn't ask me what it was, I could have done row operations to this stage and said, yes, it has an inverse, because um, I can tell there will be a pivot in every column, and therefore I will be able to turn it into the identity eventually. And so I, if, if someone said, does it have an inverse, I could have stopped right there. And it's actually way quicker to do a couple of row operations to get into this form than it is to do pretty much anything else to decide if it has one. So just so you know, you don't have to finish it. So, you know. And conversely, if at any point in your working you get a full row of zeros, you know it doesn't have an inverse. Yep? But how at that point did you decide that it did not have an inverse? Because it had, uh, the bottom was all zeros, and it had a, a non-zero number in each of these positions. And that meant that I knew I could divide that by one and clear the zero above it, and I knew I could divide that by one and clear the zeros above it too. That's how I knew. And that's called having a pivot. Like I can, I can create a pivot in each of these positions um, on all the way along the diagonal, and so therefore it has an inverse. Well done. Okay, let's do it. I've been avoiding the fraction calculations. <laughs> so, all right, row 2 is row 2 minus 4 of row 3. So 0 minus 4 of 0 is still 0. 1 minus 4 of 0 is still 1. 4 minus 4 of 1 is 0, because that was the point. 0 minus 4 lots of 3 elevenths is 0 minus 12 elevenths, which is minus 12 elevenths. Should have given myself more space. A half minus four lots of zero is still a half. Phew. And zero minus four lots of minus an eleventh is zero plus four elevenths. They weren't too bad. It's all right. Everything had zeros. It was very pleasant. Okay, now let's do the next one. Row one plus two of row three. So one plus, one plus two of zero is still one. Zero plus two of zero is still zero. Minus 2 plus 2 of 1 is 0, as it should be. This plus 2 lots of 3 elevenths is 1 and 6 elevenths, which would be 17 elevenths. Minus 1 plus 0 times something is still minus 1. And 0 plus 2 times minus an eleventh is minus 2 elevenths. They weren't very painful at all. Nice. Ta-da! It's the inverse. Therefore, A inverse, assuming I haven't made any mistakes, is this. I should probably check to see if I made any mistakes by multiplying some things. Let me just try it. So A times this should be the identity. So 17 elevenths minus 24 elevenths so 17 minus 24 uh, would be 7, minus 7, plus 6 elevenths, crap. No, is 11 elevenths, which is 1. Okay, so the first row, the first column matches the first row for getting the 1 in the right spot. I could do them all, but I'm, I feel confident Possibly it's, it's unfounded, um, based on the, the one of them. There's nine oper calculations to do to check, but I can do it. Oh, nice. Oh, cool. Okay, so um, there you go. That's finding inverses. I might stop there. Thank you. Um, don't forget the Maths Learning Centre is open um, all the way to the end of the exam period. Importantly, it is open next week, if that is relevant to you. <laughs> I personally won't be there till Thursday because I'm doing revision seminars all week.